morning, everyone. Welcome to our service. Those of you who have come on time are blessed with parking spaces and being here. Those who are later may not find parking, but hopefully they will. But welcome. Um, just thank you so much. Thank God for just this day. And you know, to be honest, guys, I'm really tired today. And, uh, I, you know, um, but you know, I, I was thinking about that and we were praying this morning. And, you know, it really is a time where we can just allow God to move, you know, and um, less of us and more of him. So um, just want to uh, encourage you today to just worship the Lord and enjoy his presence um, and just uh, pour out your love upon him and, and worship him. So let's all stand. And let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for today, Lord. And um, we just pray, God, that as we lift up our voices, Lord, and with your presence here, that you would truly just work in our hearts and help us, Lord, to just love you and worship you with everything that we have, Lord. Um, I just pray that you would be glorified, that um, through all this, Lord, that we can um, just be in your presence and soak it all in, and just pour out um, our love to you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise you, Jesus. All right. Praise you, Lord. Here we go. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. Let's sing that again. Come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are.
the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Passion for 
have your way with us, oh Lord God. Holy Spirit, fall upon us, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Glory to your name, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Glory to your name, oh God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Glory to your name, oh God. Jesus, we worship you, Lord. Thank you, God. Jesus, praise you, Lord. Glory to you, God. Jesus, praise you, Lord. Thank you, God. Were the world at the beginning one with God? You are awesome in there. 
I just want to sing that again. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. You are worthy of all praise. To you, our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Jesus, you are so good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Truly, you are awesome, God. Thank you, God. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence here. Lord, you are worthy to be praised. We sing of your awesomeness, your goodness, your power, Lord, your love. You are worthy to be praised. 
all glory and honor and worship unto you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. You're worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Go and check this uh, lapel mic. Perfect. All right. How is everyone doing this morning? Wonderful. If you haven't had a chance to just greet your neighbor, just say hello, happy Halloween. If you have a piece of candy in your pocket, pass it around. Is there a um, is there a limit on how old you can be to go trick or treating? I'm going trick or treating. Felix can't, but I can. We don't want him. People. And a lot of people yesterday said, uh, are you going to, you know, bring Felix over? It's just too much candy. The last thing I want him to be eat. I think all parents are like that, right? Try your best to keep them away from sweets and from this and that. Eventually you have to give in, but um, until he can, I don't know, annoy me <laughs> enough for candy, uh, no candy for him. So if anyone's going to give him candy, just give it to me instead. So uh, speaking of Halloween, Balboa Fest was so wonderful yesterday. Uh, let's give a round of applause for our church and our volunteers. That was a, an amazing ministry, despite the, the overcast weather and the crowds from outside lands. It was an amazing ministry. What, what really uh, just inspired me and made me so happy was to see our church coming together. This wasn't a section or this wasn't just a particular group. It was our Chinese section. It was our English section. It was our... Uh, college students who helped out, our uh, youth who helped out, our families with small kids who came and with their costumes, and, and they were also helping out. So church, I think that was a, a win in our book. That was definitely a powerful and wonderful ministry. Uh, I was just looking down the street to see, you know, what else was going on. And there were maybe three or four businesses just passing out candy. Only uh, facility that had like an event going on. Our, our church. So, so I, I, think I think that speaks volumes, volumes uh, in our community. Volumes, that speaks volumes on you know on who we are as, as a church. church. In this, uh, so pretty proud of that. Uh, a few, few announcements, announcements is we are, we are very excited, excited to announce that our very own and has expanded our support for children's ministry by accepting a full time position as our children's ministry director. So please continue to keep and. And uh, her family wanted to know that not just Anne, but also uh, Dave and Daniel, they also serve our church as well. So let's continue to keep Anne and her family and um, all of our children's ministry staff from Fort Bowl to us, Sunbeams to TCA, they all play a part in our uh, ministry here at Full Line. And today is the, I believe, last day for the pastoral appreciation. So uh, we're going to show our support to our staff, pastors and staff, especially Pastor Daniel, Sifa, as they have been here with us for one year. Uh, I believe last week, yes. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Sugar and her staff meeting that they were, they were just driving over exactly a year ago. So we praise God for uh, bringing you over, Pastor, and, and the ministry of God's place in our heart. So again, this year has been a uh, tough year, but you know, God is we also, we also have, have a, a combined, combined festival ceremony, ceremony Sunday, Sunday, November 14th, in the main, the main sanctuary. sanctuary. Uh, uh, so praise, praise the Lord, several people have expressed their desire to be baptized. If you, if you wish to make a public, public declaration to follow Jesus, please consider. Please, uh, please contact your pastor, your pastor immediately. I want to tell you something this morning. There's, there's no such thing as a secret Christian. Christian. There's, there's no such thing. If you put your faith in Christ, I want you to publicly declare it. Now, am I asking you to be like those guys at the science, you know, and burn and hell all this? That's not what it means to publicly declare your life. It's to say, I'm going to publicly acknowledge that Jesus is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords of my life. 
And after that is baptism. If you have not uh, made that decision and made that choice to go to the waters of baptism, I want to encourage you to do that. There's something powerful when you surrender your life. You know, our young people and our youth here this morning, if you have not made that decision, and think about it very carefully, this is not just uh, you know, going for a dip and coming back out. This is to publicly declare that my life is tied to Jesus. So if you've not done that, are you or adults? I want to encourage you to pray for, pray for uh, think about that. Talk to Pastor Daniel. Have young people talk to me. And we want to make sure that you guys are able to experience that moment of publicly declaring your walk with Christ. So to prepare for the baptism, a half hour baptism class will be held on Sunday. November 7th, I believe that's next week, immediately after the service and due to COVID restrictions. Oh, we will not use the baptismal pool. Instead, the water sprinkling ceremony will be performed in the sanctuary. Can I bring my super soaker? Hey. Uh, that would be a cool way to get baptized. Uh, so we also had a Thanksgiving lunch on November 21st, 12 30, right here at the gym. Uh, please sign up by Sunday, November 14th, so we can anticipate attendance and food. One thing I really look forward to is when we get together as a church, not to eat, but to cook the food. That is such a fun experience. If you have not uh, volunteered, is there going to be, uh, just a quick question, is there going to be a sign up sheet to volunteer to help cook the food? Well maybe, well, maybe we can uh, uh, get that going because one thing, one thing that's so fun is um, we come early in the morning and we're peeling potatoes. Hopefully, Phil has his oldies playlist going on, and uh, it's just a fun, a uh, great time to just serve our church, to fellowship with one another, and uh, just to make some delicious Thanksgiving food. So, uh, what better way to do that than right here at our church? So, again, there is a link to that. Uh, on your weekly update. There are also other things that we can pray for, that we can praise God for. So please take time to read that and you can be up to date on whatever is going on. Amen? Let's just pray for our offering. Father God, I just thank you for this morning and thank you that you are a God who, uh, who just with your consuming fire, Lord, that you just consume everything in our life that, we, that makes us feel like a failure, or for everything in our life that makes us feel like we're not good enough, for everything in our life that separates us from you, Lord. Father, I pray that as we are here, Worship you, Lord, as we are here to give this morning, that you are a God who sees all and knows all. Father, I pray that you just continue to minister to us this morning. I love you, Lord. In your problem, we pray. Amen. 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 Church, how's everyone doing this morning? Good. Good. Tired? Tired? No one tired. No one said she was tired a little bit. Um, has anyone, has anyone ever even been to outside dance, outside dance before? No one? No one? I have. I have. Every, Every single year, year, I just opened my window. window. And I'm sure everyone here, here has, has as well. As well. So, so uh, there, uh, there are not a lot of bands that I were really interested in. There was, there was one on Saturday I wanted to see, but um, the party's going on in the park, but there's something amazing and powerful happening here in this church. Amen, church? There's, there's something that no band and no uh, uh, hit, no song can capture. That is the presence of glory of God and gain his presence. Amen? Amen. Let's pray for those people who are part. Father God, I just thank you for those people who are part. Lord, I pray that if they are gathering on a Sunday morning to praise music and fun and, and whatever, Lord, that's great, Lord. But I pray that those people who are part will one day get to know you, will one day get to experience you, and one day will have an encounter with you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, something that I do with students when they uh, volunteer here is they come and they'll say, you know, Mr. Dawson, I'll ask them a question. Now, what do you want to do in life? What's your career? What, what do you want to do? And some of them, uh, they don't have a defined answer. They don't have a definite, okay, this is what I want to do. So I do a little exercise. What I'll do is I'll ask them a series of questions. I'll say, you know, you can answer this yourself. Would you eat um, wheat by itself? No. Okay, would you eat a raw tomato by itself? Oh, no, not really. Would you eat salt? Would you eat pepper? No. Would you eat some spice by itself? No. Would you eat uh, raw pork by itself? No. Would you drink milk straight from the cow? No. So I'm giving all these ingredients. They all say no. And I tell them this. But if I took all these ingredients, you said no. And I put them together. And I stuck it 
in an oven, and out came pizza. Would you eat it? Like, of course I would eat it. So a lot of times, our gifts and our talents come in its raw form, especially at a young age. Okay? And so what I do is I ask the students, okay, what subjects do you like? What are you gifted in? Some will say, I like, uh, I like math. Okay, what are some fun activities that you do? I like uh, to build Legos. I like to play with Lincoln Logs. I like to play Minecraft. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Um, what are some things that you feel in your heart that you want to do for the world around you? Um, I want to help people. And so what we'll do is we'll take all these uh, attributes and all these things that they like to do, and we'll look at them as ingredients. And then we put it together, and out comes, uh, I give them like five minutes or a day to think about, okay, if you take all these interests that you like, if you put them together, and if you cook with it, what can you get out of it? And all the things that I just mentioned, uh, someone might say, oh, I want to be an architect. I like to help people. I like to build, you know. Math is a, is a strong suit in, in, um, in the subjects that I like. And so something that I do with students is to understand what their purpose and calling is, I have this little exercise for them. And for some students, surprisingly, to my own shock, they actually followed through with, uh, what, with that, what we did in that exercise. And I have to remind them, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, like, telling you what to do. You can do whatever, you're, what, whatever you want. But this is just something that helps you figure out what you would like to do. And so I, in talking with our college students, I was hanging out with them this past Monday, and we got on the topic of um, Felix on, on what I would like him to do and what I aspire for him to do. So we were talking, and you know, I said, it will be kind of cool if he, um, you know, he works hard. I want him to work hard. I want him to study. I want him to read. I want him to play sports. I want him to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, all those things. You see, I have those desires because I want him to have a sense of direction in his life. And uh, especially with direction, life is too precious to be wasted. Don't you think, church? We have one life to live on earth, and what are we going to do with it? Now, a lot of times as young people, as kids, you know, we want to what? We just want to have fun. We want to be with our friends. We want to play. We want to have a good time. But as parents especially, living life for some time and being a, a new parent myself, I'm, I look at my son and I say, hey, you know, stop, you know, watching your TV show and stop playing with food. I want you to start, you know, ex exercising and reading and doing all these things. Yes, he can't do it, but there's an urgency of having a sense of direction in our children's life. And I believe that is uh, uh, important to all parents because all parents want to give their children direction. All parents want to give their children uh, a compass to move forward in life. And so, uh, you know, friends, I friends and some people I went to school with, after the dust of their 20s has settled, they're now in their 30s, they're now uh, entering in the corporate world or they're starting families, a lot of them are on Facebook and they're writing statements like, you know, is this all life has for me? And, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to figure that out. There are some of my friends who, um, when it comes to ambition, it was just, you know, whatever happened, happened. Some of my friends were extremely ambitious, and they went to great schools, and they had a great education, and they come from very uh, uh, hardworking families. But sometimes they just look at their life, and it's just like years went by, and I haven't found, like, my niche. I haven't found... My purpose, I haven't found my calling. Again, a lot of them are, are highly skilled. A lot of them have giftings and talents, but they just haven't found their groove for them to operate in. And that leads them to be very frustrated and very concerning. And so Jesus himself talks about finding that desire. He says, um, if a parent, being uh, as good as they are, would a parent offer a stone for bread or a snake if the kid asks for fish. So Jesus himself is saying, parents, being as fickle and being as uh, inconsistent as they are, are good. They want the best. So if parents are like that, how much more do you think Father God wants the best in our life when it comes to having a sense of direction and a sense of purpose? You see, uh, God has a desire for us as his children to have a sense of direction and our spiritual sense of direction 
is called what? It's called our calling. So again, our belie- as believers, our calling is summed up in the simple definition as loving God, loving people, but in a practical sense. Again, I don't want to spend too much time this morning on uh, figuring on out what your calling is. It's actually very simple. We have our first slide. It is calling is the intentional use of your time to address an issue, big or small, with your gifts or talents. What are gifts? Gifts are what you, what you naturally have, what you're naturally good at, and skills are what you choose to develop. Everyone has gifts of some sort, and everyone has time to develop skills. So again, it doesn't matter what family you come from, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter where you live, everyone has the time to develop skills. Everyone has, to have gifts. Everyone has the ability to develop their calling. So Romans 8, 28, let's turn there real quick. It says, and we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Something we need to understand this morning, church, is to be called is to have a purpose. I want you to tap your neighbor and say, to be called is to have a purpose. To be called is to have a purpose. See, everyone has to recognize two things. First is that they have a call. If you're here this morning, if you feel like, I don't have a call, I want to assure you that you do have a call. And secondly, it's to be called according to God's purpose. You have a call, and it's called according to God's purpose. See, God won't call you unless you have a purpose. And whatever has purpose, guess what, has value. See, the reason why calling and purpose and identity is so important, especially in today's world. We have a lot of young adults who are struggling with that issue of identity, which is, I believe, tied to their purpose and their calling. And because they lack a sense of identity, they have a, they ha- they have a lack of self-worth and self-value. So the reason why calling and purpose and identity is so important is because um, it carries value and in, in, in worth. One of the saddest is if you find out there is undiscovered value in your home. Imagine if you had something of immense worth and value in your house and you just threw it in your garage sale. Hey, it's just taking up space. Someone buys it and then you find out they resell it for hundreds of thousands of dollars. You'd be kicking yourself. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I let that thing go for such a cheap price. One day I was driving from my uh, place, this was a few years ago, I was driving um, from, on Fulton down to church, and as I was driving, I looked to my right, and on the corner, there were two guitars sitting on the side of the road. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. I pulled in, I walked to the guitars, and interestingly enough, as I was walking, there was another guy walking, and as soon as we locked eyes, we both knew what we wanted. So... I walked faster, and I grabbed both guitars, and I looked at both of them, and I said, you take this, I'll take that. He said, sure, and then, you know, I had this guitar. I looked at the name uh, when I was, I was holding it, Yamaha, and, uh, which is a great guitar, and the other one is called a Takamini. A Takamini is a very uh, good brand of guitar, and that particular guitar is used, it's like seven, eight hundred dollars, and it it's in my living room. It plays perfectly. It's, uh, nothing's wrong with it. Someone just threw out a seven to $800 guitar out on the street. It has a great value. I don't know why that person did that, okay? But sometimes what happens when we, with our purpose and identity is we need to understand that purpose has value. And a sad thing that many people uh, experience is a loss of sense of purpose, which feeds into a loss of sense of value in their life, throwing away things that they should keep. So another thing about purpose is that some people feel that because they went through pain and they went through hardship, that their value has decreased. There was a pastor who did this uh, great, I don't think I have anything on me. Um, uh, Actually, I think I do. Okay, I have a $10 bill. There's a pastor who used this great illustration. If he took a, a bill... Uh, and he asked, okay, what's the value? He said, it's 
uh, everyone says ten dollars, folds it in half, how much is it now? Ten dollars, dollars, he steps on it, it's still ten dollars, he spits on it, it's still ten dollars. He tears a little piece off, it's still ten dollars. So no matter what abuse that you go through, this morning I want to talk to someone who feels that maybe they have gone through hardships, maybe they've gone through abuse, maybe they've gone through it's what they feel is pain and hurt. Whatever experience that you have gone through, guess what? Your value has not decreased. God still sees you as precious. God still sees you as priceless. And so something I want you to keep this morning is that your value is connected to your uh, calling and your purpose. You see, a lot of times uh, we put, I want us to actually turn to uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 2 through 11. See, these verses play out like a movie. This is when Jesus first meets Peter. Jesus is preaching on the boat, and he goes out, and he comes back in, and he tells the disciples, hey, have you guys caught anything? And they say, Master, we have not caught. We've been fishing all day. We haven't caught anything. He says, hey, I want to go out with you, and this time I want you to throw your net on the other side. And Peter says, Jesus, we're professional fishermen. When we say there is no fish, there are no fish. But what does he do? He listens to the Lord. They go out. They get a huge catch. And Peter has this encounter with God. Jesus says, Peter, you're no longer going to be a fisher of men. I'm sorry, you're no, you're no longer going to be a, uh, a fisherman. You're going to be a fisher of men. And upon you, I'm going to, you are no longer going to be called Simon. You're going to be called Peter. And on this rock, I am going to build my church. See, Peter was called in this moment. And what does Peter do? He leaves his nets behind, and he goes and he follows Jesus. Something about calling is that I want us to think about it in a want or need category. Something about calling is some people will have a tendency to put their calling in a want category instead of a need calling, uh, instead of a need category. You see, what happens when you treat it as a want, Versus what happens as you treat it, a young man who came to church this past week. I'm not sharing this to uh, embarrass or to be mean, uh, but he just came and, you know, was talking to me. And he said, hey, Mr. Dawson, I need you to write me a, uh, a recommendation letter for college. I was like, well, hang on a sec. Like, first, I don't really know you. I, uh, I just know your name, and uh, that's about it. And I said, okay, so... Where are you going? Uh, I'm going somewhere in Texas, somewhere in Austin, you know, Texas A&M or something. And I said, well, if you want me to write a recommendation letter, I'd like you to volunteer first, you know, for me to get to know you. He says, well, you've written my other friend's uh, recommendation letters. I said, yes, because I've, they volunteer here. Some of them have even gone on a mission trip with me to Las Vegas. I, I've known them. I, I talked to their parents. I've gotten to uh, meet with them and be friends with them. They come like every single Friday, they're, they participate. And so he's like, okay. Um, and I asked him, well, what do you want to do? I want to be a contractor. Okay. Contract what? You can be a contractor in many things. Building things. Okay. Um, can you give me some other, you know, descriptions of who you are as a person? After a long pause, he said, I'm nice. Okay. Uh, when was the last? When was the last nice thing you did? He said, "Okay." When was the last nice thing you did this month? And after a long pause, he said, uh, "In school, someone had some trouble with uh, Google Sheets, and I helped them out." Okay, great. What was the last thing you built? No joke. He's like, "Does Legos count?" I said, "Okay, sure." So you want me to write a resume of your nice? You build with Legos. You want it? Me to write? Like, I can't write that. Um, and so I told this young man, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to work on um, your ambition. I want you to read. He's like, I don't like to read. Well, I want you to read. Okay, I want you to watch YouTube videos that pertain to your interest. And I want you to start volunteering. If you can do those things, and if I get to know you, and if you start, and I can see you taking uh, it serious, then maybe I can write you a recommendation letter. And so with this young man, he was treated as a want, something that he just wants. It's not a need. You see, a difference between a want and a need, everyone knows this this morning, 
is when it's a want, it's just a desire. It's something that you just, you know, I would like this, I would want this, but when it's a need, you will, guess what? You will leave your boat behind. You will leave your net behind. You will you kiss your wife and children goodbye, and you will say, I am following Jesus. So this morning, I don't want to talk to people whose calling is just a want. I don't want to talk to people who, whose calling is just a, a, a desire or something they would like to figure out. I want to talk this morning to people who, uh, who need to find their calling and purpose in life. Amen? How many of you need to find your calling? I need to find my calling. Come on, church. How many of you want to find your calling? You need to find your calling. I need to find my calling in my life. You see, uh, <clears throat> some people know their calling. Some people know their calling, and that's all it ever is. Just something that they are aware of. Something that they know. My calling is to do this, and that's all it ever is. Just information in their mind. So finding your calling is crucial, and as equally as important as finding your calling is nourishing that calling. If you're taking notes, the title of this sermon is called Nourishing Your Calling. Finding your calling is important. It's great. I give you a simple formula on how to find your calling, but what is as equally important is nourishing your calling, because sometimes, guess what? If we don't nourish our calling, it can shrivel up and die. If we don't nourish God's desire in our life, it can be like a fire that gets extinguished. If we don't nourish our calling, it will just sit on a shelf and never be used. So I want to encourage you this morning uh, to feed that desire and that commission that God has placed in your life. Amen? Amen. Uh, I want us to turn to Judges chapter 6. We're going to be in the book of Judges this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8. We're going to be going through a few texts. But as you are going through the book of Judges, I want to give you a recap on what's going on. How many of you have ever seen the movie Men in Black? Will Smith, Tommy Lee Jones, they fight aliens. And there's a scene where uh, Tommy Lee Jones is sitting on this bench, and he's talking to Will Smith about humans and humanity. And he says this thing, and I love it. He says, uh, a person is smart. People are dumb. And if there ever was a time to see that, it was last year okay, during uh, COVID. You see people panicking, people uh, buying uh, tons of toilet paper. There was, I, maybe you guys saw this in the news. There was a person on the East Coast who bought um, like shipment containers worth of the hand-cleaning sanitizer, and he was trying to like uh, flip five times the price, and he actually got caught. And the funny thing is, everyone decided not to buy from him, and so he was stuck with all this stuff. So people sometimes can be dumb. Now a person can be smart, but sometimes people can be dumb. And this is evident with the Hebrews. So uh, the Hebrews, as a person, they did amazing things. The Bible is full of them. We have Joshua did amazing things. Amazing things. Hezekiah did amazing things. Daniel and his friends all did amazing things. But as people, as Israelites, they always fell into the same destructive behavior. You read how they honored God, then they forgot him. They honored God, then they forgot him. They honored God, and they forgot him. And so Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, we see Israel is going through the terrible twos. They forget who... The bosses. Let's read verse 1 through 10. It says this, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up. Also the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. Now, if you look at a map, the Midianites and the Amalekites were on the east side of Israel. If you are with geography, you can have a mental note how Israel looks like. It's like a sliver of There is to the right, this huge uh, empty desert where Mesopotamia is located. And to the left, you have the Mediterranean Sea. So they, bo they're, they're, they border the ocean. So the Bible says is that from the east, 
all the way to the west to Gaza, which is a, uh, uh, a city by the sea, the enemy raided and razed everything. Everything was wiped out. Verse 4 says, Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So here's the deal. Before they came into the promised land, we know that children of Israel were where? Help me out, church. Where were they before they came into the promised land? They were in either in Egypt. And in Egypt, they were what? They were slaves. All right. So they were in Egypt, and they were slaves. See, now they're in the promised land, and they're now they're in bondage and in slavery again, this time not to a country. Now they are in slavery and bondage to their desire. Something that is very dangerous for us in life is to be a slave to our desires. You see, when the Israel was a slave to the desires, it allowed the enemy to rule over them simply because they could not master and control their desires. Right there is a message in itself. See, one of the worst things that you can be a slave to is unhealthy desires. A person who cannot put down a donut, a person like me who cannot put down a slice of pizza. Salome always gets on my case. She's like, uh, when you're happy, you want to eat pizza. When you're sad, you want to cheer yourself up, so you eat pizza. When you do this, you want to eat pizza. Everything is always pizza, pizza, pizza. Okay, I'm, I'm a slave to pizza. See, like an alcoholic is a slave to a craving. Um, I, I want to show this picture. There is the next slide, if we can get it. There is a, uh, uh, this poster I saw on Geary. If, uh, whoever's in the sound room, if you can just put this uh, picture up on the slide. Uh, the one before that? Or the one after that? There we go. You can't see it, but if you live in outer Richmond, if you walked on Geary, you might have seen this before. This is a sign on a smoke shop. And I'm going to read what this text says. Listen to this. It says, I smoke because I like to smoke. I smoke because I want to smoke. Smoking pleases me. My life is better because I smoke. I accept responsibility for all my actions. I want the freedom to choose to smoke. Notice how they use the word, the freedom to choose to smoke when it's an addiction. I can choose how to make myself happy. I own myself. Smoking is my choice. It's a very libera liberating statement, right? Don't you think so? The language and the words that they use. Smoking is my choice, and it makes me happy. And they have a picture of a Native American gentleman crossing his hands like this, smiling, looking at the distance. So it looks like a very auspicious, wise statement, almost as if this guy is saying it. And next to him, you have Bob Marley, smoking and having fun and laughing. There is an image behind being a slave to desire. That's why one of some of the most vulgar, inappropriate, perverse, blasphemous things always come what? Wrapped up in a very catchy tune or in a very cool movie or a very interesting book. Okay? So Israel was a slave to their desires. See, God gave Israel the means to live. He, he says, you know, when you conquer the promised land, you're going to move into the houses of the people that you conquered. But they forfeited their claim by doing evil. And guess what? They thought the problem was the enemy. They thought the problem was the Midianites coming and taking the produce and the Amalekites coming and uh, burning all the livestock. But the real problem was that they were sinning and they forgot God. See, Israel's sins made their work profitless. It's so hard, it's so frustrating to work hard and to have nothing come out of it. To invest your time, your effort, and energy. You put your, your heart and soul into it. And what happens? Nothing. You break even. Nothing was accomplished. It's frustrating. So, go ahead and pray. Go ahead and cry out. But there is a change that you're going to have to make if you want to see something different happen. First Chronicles 7.14, it says, if my people who are called by my name 
will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. So despite this, God sends a prophet to the people. Okay? In fact, you'll have to pardon me. I uh, skipped some verses. In verse 7, it says, to pass, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt, and I brought you into the house, uh, out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who blessed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So what God does is he sends a prophet to these people. See, what's very interesting is the prophet speaks to the nation. His calling is recognized, but his name is unknown. We don't know the name of this prophet. The Bible doesn't say. His calling is recognized, but his name is unknown. If we can just go to um, the slide that we had previously with the uh, uh, black and white text, something that I want you to write down is people will remember you in the context of your calling. I believe, yeah, Abraham Lincoln. People will remember you in the context of your calling. When we look at the picture of this gentleman behind me, do we remember that he is simply just a tall person? Do you remember that he just wears a funny-looking hat? Do you remember that he just has a beard? Or do you remember him as a great leader? People remember you in the context of your calling. They might forget you, but they will remember what you did. People, might, people who were here yesterday for Balboa Fest, they might forget this building. They might even forget the name, which is perfectly fine, but they will remember hey, a church reached out and impacted this community. Amen? So people will remember you in the context of your calling. So I want us to uh, now look at chapter 6 later on in the passage. So though some people might not immediately recognize your calling, God sees your calling and who you ought to be. See, to change a nation, God changed one man by giving him a calling. It's so amazing how God can change one thing of a person and it can change an entire situation and calling. I want to talk about Gideon for some time. How many of you have ever heard of Gideon in the Bible? He's a very interesting character. There's some, just some facts about him in one of these slides. He's the fourth judge. We're in the book of Judges. This is a time where there was really no leader in Israel. The Bible, um, in the book of Joshua, the book right before Judges ends with, and the people did uh, whatever they wanted. The intro for the book of Judges begins the same way. There was no leader, there was no king, there was no priest or prophet, and people just kind of did whatever they wanted. And in these moments, whenever the people of Israel sinned and they cried upon God and they said, God, we need you to help us and rescue us, God would raise up a judge to rescue and to help his people. So Gideon is the fourth judge. He was one of the greatest judges in the history of Israel. And the thing is, Great things have small beginnings. Gideon does not come from a politically prominent family. Gideon does not come from a quote-unquote quote, quote rich family. He does not come from a warrior family. But there's something that God is going to use in his life to develop the calling in his life. Like I said earlier, the title of this message is Nourishing Your Calling. There are four areas in the life of Gideon that allowed him to develop and nourish his calling. Again, so important that we feed our calling, that we feed the desire that God has placed in our life and we don't allow it to be extinguished. So number one, it is having an encounter with God. Chapter 6, verse 11 through 12, it says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under a terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abrazite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man. There. And look at something very important. Gideon is threshing wheat in the wine press. Now I have a picture of a threshing floor for wheat. If we can just pull that picture up real quick. This is where you thresh wheat. It's supposed to be in an elevated, open place. Usually people in uh, this... Um, 
area or this time, they would do it in hills or they would do it in mountains when the wind was blowing. In fact, I would see my, when I, would, uh, when I was in India, I saw my grandma uh, threshing uh, wheat or actually winnowing wheat. And, uh, what she would do is she would have a basket and there were some grains of wheat. And what you would do it is you would, uh, has anyone ever done that before or seen anyone do it? But you would do, you, you kind of throw it in the air and the wind blows the chaff away, the, the things that you necessarily don't want to eat. And the more you do it, and the finer you grind it and the blow away the impurities, the, the wider the, the wheat comes. Okay? You see like whole wheat bread versus white bread. The difference is one of them was winnowed and uh, uh, a little bit more than the other. So this is where you want to do it, in a wide open space where the wind can blow. Okay? But the Bible says this, that Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. How many of you ever have uh, seen a wine press before? Okay? There is another image I want us to pull up of a wine press. This is a wine press that they would use in the ancient times. What you would do is you fill it up with grapes and you stomp on it. In my old hometown, they, we have a, uh, a vineyard and they have this, like, this uh, funny competition. Uh, I think it's called like trash to dress, dress or something. And uh, women wear their wedding dress and they step on grapes and, and they do that. I don't know, maybe they got divorced or something. I don't know, they don't want it. So um, this is where you would want to uh, press you know, the grapes to develop wine. You don't want to thresh wheat in here. The reason why is because it is a depressed location. Wind can't blow over it. It's not going to do your job effectively. And so we see something about Gideon. You see, running away from the enemy, he's running away from the enemy and not being in your calling of threshing wheat properly will have a negative impact in your work. We see Gideon scared. We see Gideon hiding from the enemy, doing something in a place that shouldn't be done. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. See, life will complicate itself when you're afraid. Again, I'm talking to people who need to nourish their calling. Life will complicate itself when you're afraid. I want to encourage you to never be afraid to live out your conviction and your calling. Like earlier this morning, if you're wanting to publicly declare your faith in Christ, you know, get baptized. Let it be a public declaration of your faith in Jesus. Something that's so important is if you're going to live a faith of life, I want you to not care what other people think. If we have godly convictions, if we have a conviction to serve God, if we have a conviction say, I want to live a life that is pleasing to the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid of what other people will think. So many people, oh, what will other people think if I say this? I'm not talking about being like just rude or being nasty or being mean. I'm talking about just living your conviction. What will people think if I say that? What will people think if I do this? My sister, as some of you know, she's involved in music. And in her uh, music production, there are songs that people want her to sing. And her conviction is to sing, as they say, quote, unquote, clean music. No curse words, no sexually explicit lyrics, no, you know, anything like that. And that's her conviction. People will say, okay, you know, how about, how about you sing the song and that portion, someone else can say those words or someone else can sing those lyrics. No, I don't want to do that. And guess what? You know, some opportunities uh, are past, but that's okay. That's a conviction that she has. And I thank God that she has that conviction because not only does she have that conviction, that, uh, that inspires people to say, you know what, maybe I'm going to change the song a little bit. Or sometimes that conviction brings other opportunities in your life. So again, never live your life being afraid to live a life of conviction. You see, one of the biggest thing, one of the biggest killers of developing our calling is fear. What will people think? What will people do if I step outside my comfort zone and go about my desire and calling? Verse 13 onwards, it says, Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our forefathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go into this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? 
So Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Something that always precedes a call of God in our life is having an encounter. See, having an encounter emboldens him to accept his calling. If some stranger just said, hey, Gideon, to rescue the nation of Israel, he would say, hey, can you stop disturbing me? I'm fighting for the enemy. But it was with an encounter of God that Gideon says, you know what? Maybe God does have a call in my life. Maybe he does have a purpose. Maybe I do sense a value, and I'm going to do something amazing for God and my nation. So something that we need to understand about uh, developing and nourishing our calling is, number one, we need to have an encounter with God before we find our calling. See, some of you are searching for a call without first seeking an encounter with God. I have a slide up here. Seek an encounter with God before you seek your calling. See, before he could be named Paul, what happened to Saul? He first had an encounter with God on the road to Damascus, which forever changed his life. Something about Judas is that he had a call, but no encounter with Christ. To every single one of the disciples, they had a calling of God, and they knew uh, what uh, Christ wanted to do. They knew his calling. They knew what uh, God's call on their life was, to go out into the world and preach the gospel. Judas, he, guess what? He had a call, but he never truly encountered Christ for who he wanted to be in Judas's life. We all know what happened to that individual. So again, seek an encounter with God before you seek your call. Those of you who have a desire, you have a purpose, I want to encourage you to continually seek having an encounter with God. Someone once said, God does not call the equipped. He equips the call. Sometimes we feel like, I need to get all my stuff together. I need to have everything perfect. I need to have everything right. Then God can use me, but I want to encourage you. If you are seeking an encounter with God, he's going to equip you for your calling. Amen, church? So I want to encourage you to seek an encounter with God. See, you don't call someone you don't want. You don't call anyone without a purpose. You don't call someone you're not wanting to have a relationship. God does want to call you. God does have a plan and purpose in your life. God does want to develop uh, a, a gifting to uh, do something amazing. But first, you need to develop your encounter with Christ. A lot of times your calling is not going to wait for you. So Gideon is uh, busy doing his thing, and his calling comes immediately because he has an encounter. When you have that encounter with Christ, it, something will develop and something will happen many times immediately. So number one, have an encounter with God in your life. Number two, have courage. We're going to be looking at verses 25 through 27. It says, now it came to pass that same night that the Lord said to Gideon, take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father's has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. See, Gideon's family, they were idolaters. Though they knew who God was, they were worshiping idols in their home. God says, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household, the men of the city uh, uh, too much to do it by day, he did it by night. So what God told Gideon is, I want you to take the idol, the image that you have in your home, I want you to cut it down, I want you to sacrifice a bull, and I want you to use that idol as fuel for that sacrifice. So something to do very well is we need to have the courage to execute our calling. We need to have the courage to take action in our calling. See, Gideon thought God could do nothing because he and his family were nothing. Gideon accepted the call, but he was terrified. See, Gideon had one major issue that affected his calling and that he uh, was afraid. He was fearful. So here's the thing about fear. I want you to write this down. Fear always tries to legitimize bad behavior and poor decisions. 
Fear always tries to legitimize bad behavior and poor decisions. Sometimes we say to ourselves, well, because I was afraid, I did such and such. If we look in Scripture, because they were afraid, Adam and he did, uh, did what? They hid themselves from God. Because he was afraid, Abraham lied about Sarah being his wife. Because he was afraid, the fool's servant did what? Buried the t one talent that he had. See, think of the last time, uh, even with our students and, and, and our adults here, think of the last time you lied to your parents. Why did you do it? Because you were, what? You were afraid. Sometimes we make foolish decisions being afraid. A lot of times, your calling will knock on your door when you least expect it. See, your calling never waits until you're ready. Your calling will never wait until you feel confident. Your calling will never feel, wait until you feel like Superman and you feel like you can defeat the whole world. Your calling will come when it says, you know what? It's time to do something in your life. It's very important when God has a calling on our life that we nurture it with courage by getting into God's word and say, yes, yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff, they come for me. God has a calling on each and every single one of this morning, but sometimes what stops us is fear. Sometimes what stops us is taking that first step. You see, uh, in his calling, Gideon had to engage uh, his, uh, before he can engage the national enemies, Gideon had to first engage the enemies in his own home. See, your calling is going to require you to take courage and make a sacrifice. And here's the thing about uh, the courage that Gideon has. He's doing something that he knows that will get him killed, but God is still developing that, uh, God is still calling him to uh, take courage and to perform that sacrifice. Gideon also does something crazy. He sacrifices a bull when there's a famine going on, when the enemy is destroying all the produce, when the enemy is destroying everything, it, it takes courage to sacrifice to pursue your calling. Some of us here this morning, we have a call of God. We've had an encounter. But one thing that we're lacking is taking the courage to sacrifice what God is calling us to sacrifice to take that next step forward. See, Gideon just didn't have to face the enemy. He also had to face his family. That takes real courage. It's very easy to, and I hope no one does this over here, to cuss someone out who cuts you, uh, who cuts you off uh, when you're driving. Please don't do that, okay? You're not going to see that person again, but to, to, to say to something to a person that you know very well that's hurt you, or to say something to someone you know very well that you want to see a change of behavior, that's not very comfortable. That takes courage. See, if your calling is not being done in your home, I don't believe you're ready to take that calling out into the world. If your calling is hospitality, and if you're you know, taking care of everyone else, but if you're not taking care of your own home, focus on your home first. That's what Gideon did. Before he engaged the national enemies, he said, I'm going to take care of the enemy in my home right here. See, uh, if you're busy sharing the, the, the love of God with everyone in the world, but neglecting to share the love of Christ and to personify the love of Christ, in your home, you need to start in your house first. See, here's the thing. Cut down your idols. Don't move them to your peripheral vision. A lot of times people move idols to the peripheral vision. Cut down your idols. See, when God has a call on your life, destroy the things that deviate your calling. If you're going to follow the idol, your idol is going to lead you to thresh wheat in the wine press. If you're going to follow God Almighty, he's going to equip you with the courage and the strength to face the enemy. So again, what's stopping many of you here this morning has, you have an encounter, you have a calling, you have a desire, you need to have your calling personified. But I want to encourage you to take courage, to step out. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Step out outside of your comfort zone, and God can do something amazing in your life. You see, the next thing we need to do is engage. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. It's a little bit longer passage, but I want you to stick with me. It says, Gideon and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the wall of Herod so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moriah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many 
for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel come claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. God is saying, you did a great job. You got a whole bunch of people uh, with you to fight, but this is too many. Because what's going to happen is people are going to say, hey, we delivered ourselves from the enemy, and there's not going to be a true change of heart in the nation of Israel. So I want you to do something. And what God tells Gideon to do is absolutely crazy. It says in verse 3, now, there, uh, now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And the Bible says 22,000 of the people were turned and 10,000 remained. So altogether, he had 32,000 people ready to fight. And Gideon says, okay, guys, anyone scared? Go home. 22,000 uh, 22, people leave. What are scared people doing fighting? Be very careful who you ask to fight in your battles. Be very careful who you ask. Hey, Alan, I'm going to fight with you. I'm here for you. When it comes to actually standing in the gap, people back out. You don't want to have people who are scared in your corner. You don't want to have people who are scared fighting your battles. Be very cautious who you call to fight in your army. Verse 4 says, But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. I want you to bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that um, whom I say to you, this one shall go, and the same shall go with you. And whoever, whoever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set him apart by himself. Likewise, Everyone who gets down on his knees to drink water, the number of those who lapped putting their hand to their mouth was 300. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand and let all the other people go, every man to his place. And so the people took provisions and the trumpets in their hands, and he sent all, uh, away all the rest of Israel every man into his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. What happens next in this passage is Gideon is still frightened, but he's taking the courage. He says, you know what? God is wanting to do something in my life. I'm going to have these 300 guys. And God says, you know what? I'm going to encourage you by sending you out into the enemy camp. And so Gideon, with uh, uh, his servant, goes into the enemy camp, and he hears Two soldiers talking, hey, I had a dream, and in this dream, there was a piece of bread, and it rolled down to our camp, and it destroyed everything. I feel that this piece of bread is Gideon, and what happens is you see, Gideon hears that Midianites are scared of him and his warriors. So Gideon, eventually, he builds that courage, and he builds that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, attitude to de defeat Lord, the, the enemy of Israel. So here's the thing. When God has, gives you a call in your life, this is number three, having courage. When God has a call in your life, do not, uh, your calling never belongs in isolation. When God has a calling in your life, when God has a purpose and desire in your life, that calling in isolation. Something as simple as swinging a stone and saving sheep from a lion and a bear if that talent was stuck in isolation, David would have never taken down Goliath and delivered Israel. A simple thing as interpreting dreams. If Joseph would only interpret the dreams of his dad and brothers, and if he would never take that gift and interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, he would have never rescued a nation and saved his family. Your calling is never to be executed in isolation. It's very important that you find people to walk in your calling. Imagine if Colonel Sanders kept his secret recipe, quote unquote, a secret his entire life. It was only when he was what? 62 years old when he decided to get other people on board that something ever happened. I was reading about him and he was operating, he was selling uh, KFC chicken, 62 years old out of a gas station, just him and his wife. It was only when he said, you know what, I think I'm going to bring other people on board and, uh, and, and, re-revolutionize how chicken is sold to people, 
then you see prominence in his life. Your calling, no matter how great it can be, is never meant to be done isolated, never, be, never meant to be done alone. So it's so important that you involve people in your calling. Even our walk with God is never meant to be done alone. Some people say, you know, I believe in God, but I don't necessarily go to church. Guess what? You're operating alone. So you cannot fight enemies all by yourself, all alone. If you don't want to go to this church, find another church. If not these 300, find another 300. See, your calling was never meant to be done alone. It's meant to be done with other people in your life. Jesus says this, when you go out, he sends them out. He says, when you go out, I want you to go by two by two. To cast out demons, to heal, to pray for the sick, people from the dead. It's not that the Holy Spirit is less effective by just sending one person. It's for you. It's when you are engaging the enemy. It's when you need time, uh, when, when you have uh, areas in your life where you need courage. It's when you need to develop an encounter with God. When you need to have friends in your life. This is so you, it's for your benefit. It's where you can have someone walking and marching with you. Even though you might be from the same country, you might be from the same tribe, you might be drinking from the same water, not everyone who goes with you is equipped to fight in your battles. Be very careful, especially students. Not everyone you go to school with, not everyone that's in your friends group, not everyone that has the same likes and desires is equipped to be with you in the difficult battles that you guys are facing. It's very important in the calling that our young people have, that you guys uh, equip, that you guys involve people who are tied to your calling. Be very careful who you allow people to fight for you and to fight with you. You don't want people who will run in those difficult circumstances, in those difficult uh, decisions. You want to have people who will fight for you in your calling. Finally, fourthly, is to exalt. What happens in the story of Gideon is that God calls him to surround the enemy camp. And what happens is that Gideon and his soldiers, they blow the trumpet and break the pot, and the enemy sees Gideon and his army encamped around them, and there's a great confusion. And what happens is the enemy starts to kill themselves. They start attacking themselves, and they run away, and then Gideon runs down, and he starts to overrun the camp. And at this point, then the rest of the people who were afraid, the rest of the people who were sent away, they start to re-engage with Gideon. And some of them even get jealous. They say, Gideon, you were fighting the enemy without us? What happened? And Gideon is given a great victory. And what happens is that the, the, the Midianites, the Amalekites, all those people leave him alone, and there was a great plunder. And what happens is the people say, Gideon, you have saved us. We're going to be in verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 22 through 23, just two verses. It says, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson. They said, we want to create a dynasty, Gideon. You saved us. Again, Gideon, the guy who was nothing, the least of the tribes. And in the least of the tribes, the smallest of the families. That guy is now being called a hero. They say, we want to make you a king. Not just you a king, but your son a king and even your grandson a king. We want you to have... Uh, rulership over us. And what, ha what happens as a king? The perks come with being a king. You get to live in a castle. You get to live off of a taxes. You get to uh, live a lavish life. But Gideon says this. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son over you. The Lord shall rule over you. See, Gideon was asked to be a king, but he remembers who called him into his calling and acknowledges the king of kings. In our calling and in our desire, in our purpose, we need to remember to always exalt God in our calling. Uh, there's a, uh, a quote I want to share with you by Charles Spurgeon. It says, we'll pull this uh, image up. When God calls you to be a servant, don't stoop to be a king. I love that quote. When God calls you to be a servant, don't lower your standard to be a king. There's something so amazing serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Church. When we serve God, that is the greatest thing that we can do. Calling is operating in the will and purpose. Like I said earlier, everyone is called according to his purpose. When our calling is working according to his purpose, that is the greatest place you can be in your life. See, whatever your calling is, great or small, always remain humble 
and use it for the Lord. See, every single person here, I want you guys to listen to this. Every single person here is called into, into ministry. Every single person here is called into ministry. You might be wondering, uh, how can I exalt Christ when, uh, when I'm not working, quote-unquote, in the ministry? How can I exalt the Lord if I'm not a pastor or uh, working in a church? How can I do that? And I'm going to tell you how you can do that. I want you to think real hard about this. I'm going to say it twice. Not everything we do is ministry, but we can minister in everything we do. I'm going to say that one more time. Not everything we do is ministry, but we can minister in everything we do. Let me explain that. See, it's not ministry to work in a secular field, but when we work, we can represent Christ in our conduct and in our and in accomplishments. So, uh, my, my sister's friend, uh, she's here in San Francisco. Uh, she uses she makes cookies. All she does is she makes chocolate. Uh, she's a um, like uh, a chef, she went to culinary school, she worked at some like great restaurants, and all she does is she makes cookies. That's, that's her business, making cookies. But she, as she makes cookies, she uses that platform to talk about human trafficking. She uses that platform to represent Christ in her conduct and in, in, in her ministry. What I love about this is that she preaches to a crowd without having, having a building or a title. She's able to preach a sermon without having a building or a title. Again, not everything we do is ministry, but we can minister in everything we do. And I know that for a fact that so many people here minister in what they do in this church. So I want to encourage you, God has a calling in your life. God has a purpose in your life. It's not just to be executed and to function within the four walls of Full Life Christian Center. He, your calling and your purpose can also function outside of these church walls. God has a purpose. God has a calling in your life. See, God can call you to be a pastor. I'm sorry. Uh, you can lead people to the Lord without being called to a pastor. You can sing a song without being called to be a musician. And you can preach the gospel without, being, without stepping a foot into a seminary. God has something in your life, but I want to encourage you to exalt him in whatever you do. Just like Gideon, he was asked to be a king, but he says, no, it's the king of kings who is going to rule over us, church. Amen? Something that we need to understand about our calling is that our calling is not a title. Our calling is what we have accomplished. I'm going to wrap it up real soon. In talking about our calling, a lot of times people aspire for a title. A lot of times people aspire for a degree. They want to be called a certain thing, but that's not our calling. Our true calling is what we accomplish. It says, um, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have to understand that the well done comes before faithful servant. Some people are so wanting, uh, so uh, enthusiastic to hear, okay, is God going to call me a faithful servant? First, let's work on hearing well done first. I want to hear a well done, then a faithful servant. So this morning, church, every single one of you has a calling and purpose in your life. And there are four areas where you can develop that and to nourish it. If you have a calling, I want you to do this. I want you to have an encounter with God. I want you to take courage. I want you to engage people in your life, engage people in your calling. And with your calling, I want you to exalt the Lord. Amen, church? Can we do that this morning? Amen. Father God, I thank you this morning for who you are. I thank you that you're a God who sees us in our calling, despite when we might be afraid, despite when we might be threshing weed in the wine press, when we, when we feel frightened, when we feel like we are not operating in our call. You're a God who calls us out and says, oh, mighty man, oh, mighty woman of valor, Lord, I pray that as Gideon rescued his nation, that as we step into our calling, we can rescue our family, Lord, that we can rescue our friends, Lord, we can rescue uh, in what, where we work, Lord, Father God. Lord, I pray that as we operate in our calling, that you will continue to use us, Lord, that you can continue to use us to make a difference in this world around us. We love you, Lord. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, as we go out, live out your call. Live out your purpose, and let's make a difference for the Lord. Amen? Amen. Love you guys.
I'll see you next next week. And um, come hungry. We have Thanksgiving lunch on, I believe that's the 21st. And so please, this is a great opportunity to invite your friends, invite your family, invite your coworker, invite your neighbor. And uh, let's have a great during our Thanksgiving meal. Amen. I'll see you guys later. Take care.